A Chenis ILV, Chenis lifeboat. Uh, listen for the helicopter now and follow his instructions, over. Yeah, the RNLI first put uh, a lifeboat station at Sheerness uh, on evaluation trials in 1969. This particular boat here, uh, we evaluated that boat and uh, two or three others that went out of service until such times as we had our own station boat, and this particular boat was Gertrude. And we got quite attached to her. And I must admit, the first time I saw her, I didn't... <clears throat> particularly like her and I remember going down to Brightland CBD inspector of lifeboats to pick her up and you tend to look at your new boat you know and uh, I thought not really this is not the not the boat for me and then gradually you sort of warm to the boat because these particular boats the old boats they got a lot of personality and character I would say that uh, the boat that I've got at the moment steel boat um, they haven't got the personality or the character that, that, the, that the older boats have got. Of course, they do the job, and uh, that's the name of the game, really, you see. Because the speed is terrific. You know, the speed with this boat now, we're going down at 15 knots, whereas with Gertrude, we used to be going down at 8. I remember uh, the first job we ever did with the boat, uh, we happened to be on board, sort of checking over the equipment and everything, and just across the top of Grain Spit, which is just bull half a mile from the lifeboat station, a small speedboat fired a flare. And there we were away, quick as a flash, 15 knots, across the top of the spitway. The tide was just right for us to go straight across the top, not have any water worries. And we literally arrived alongside the craft, and the woman still had the smoking flare in her hand. I joined the lifeboat crew shortly after the station was established at Sheerness. There were a substantial number of people who volunteered for the crew at that time, and most of us were raw landsmen. I had a, a very small boat, of which I was a part owner, and when I go back and think of the things which I did in that little boat now, with the knowledge which I've gleaned, uh, you know, ten years of tuition by the lifeboat coxswain, I shudder. I took risks which I now see other people taking and which I could disapprove of. I've been a member of this crew for the last 10 years and I enjoy doing it. I wouldn't Obviously, I wouldn't be doing the thing if I didn't enjoy it. Uh, there's another rather personal reason that I've chosen to be a member of the crew. I lost a brother in the water just up the river. I know it doesn't matter if there'd have been 100 boats in the area, he would never have been saved. But I've often felt that if the, anything like of that nature happens again, perhaps it could be prevented. Starboard quarter!
Right, get down there with him then. Come on, help him. Cold cock. Did you get the idea? Yeah. yeah. So the idea is now is you come aboard, okay? You've seen everything happen, man go overboard, what everybody does on the boat, and we'll do the same thing again using a fender this time. If you sat down and thought about it, you wouldn't do it at all, but it's just one of those kind of things. You do it and then you stick to it. There's a lot of discipline on the boat, but after you come off on a service or the training's finished, uh, it's totally relaxed and you, you'll pile off down to the pub and it's a totally different atmosphere. But once you're on the boat, then that's where the discipline's got to be and, and you sort of realise that. You know what you've got to do. Man overboard, life belt, bow took, man up forward to point. And it's usually the man that seen the man go overboard that goes straight up forward and points at him. We'll try it again. Before I came here, I didn't know anything at all about boats, and now I think that I'm learning a tremendous lot general things uh, like rope work and how to handle the boat and it just all builds up. <laughs> we didn't really want to anchor the boat, you know, so we started jogging up and down, you see. So anyway, he came out on deck. He was standing around the back of the wheelhouse and because it was snowing and sleeting and blowing, so we had the canopy on the back of the wheelhouse. Because he swerved up because he wasn't feeling all that. And he went to be sick. Of course, it was up the winded. He went to swerve round to be sick downwind. Didn't make it, was sick all over him. I didn't see this bit. The bit I see was him throwing buckets of water over him like past three in the morning. Just tidying him up a little no, bit. I think we've they got to be in love, haven't they? Do you know what I mean? You get a bond of friendship between. How many of there is? Twelve. And I don't really think that when people turn up to a lifeboat station, they're not what you would call do-gooders. They're not going there because they say, I want to help the community, I want to go out and help save people's lives. They like boats. They like the team spirit that's in the lifeboat service. And the the end product comes to saving the people's lives. You get those, they turn up, you see, and they think they're Britain's answer to action, man. But as I say, they don't last long. They don't last long. For the benefit of the new fellas now, we'll do a breeches boy in slow time. But the idea is, is we'll come up now to the lash lighters, we'll anchor the boat, veer back on the lash lighters, Rocket, veering lines, everything in slow time, okay? Are we ready? Yeah. Hey? Yes, yeah. ready. Well, tell me then. Right, oh, we're ready. It's particularly important in the sort of situation that we find ourselves in that people act in a disciplined fashion and you know, our crew is very disciplined. You know, we've got one chief, and everybody else is Indians. The way he runs the boat, uh, perhaps, perhaps not as all lifeboat stations are run, but this one, being a young station, starting out with a young crew, inexperienced crew, and he is moulded us to his way of seamanship. He doesn't like anybody messing about. There's time for messing about and there's time for serious work. If we're out on a service, it is all serious stuff. And things don't go properly, he will give you one hell of a rucking. 
Yes, you're all right, Chas. Now, what I want to know is where it's leading. I want to see your arm all the time. It's no good you nodding your head at me, cock. Point where the thing's leading. Sometimes the tone of his voice becomes a little sharp. I've gone up the road, I've come home cursing his name. But uh, if the phone had rung ten minutes after I got home, I'd been into my wetsuit, down to the boat, on board and away. No hesitation at all. Ready. Firing! <laughs> Grab it, cock! Slack away. Slack away. Give it to them. Pay it out. Go on, there's two men pulling that across there. There's a lot of weight. Ready when you are, Rick. Right. When you are. Slack away, fella. Take him up alongside right, now. Bring him up alongside now. Right up alongside to the well. Everything went quite well. Rocket across, made fast the veering lines, tail block, man coming back, just a job. As soon as he's approaching the stern of the boat and reminding yourself that this boat will be pitching about, so you won't be able to crawl around like a load of out of work wrens. Do you know what I mean? It takes five minutes to call the crew out, or ten or eleven minutes if they've been called from their home. It's done by telephone during the evening, but during the day, because all the crew, with the exception of one, work in the docks, it's done by the normal method of firing a maroon. Procedure for launching the lifeboat is standard throughout the country, something which the institution itself have come down fairly firmly on. Normally, if there's an incident afloat, the person who's observed it makes some sort of call, whether it's by telephone or literally running up to the Coast Guard station. And from that point onwards, the Coast Guard assess the requirement for some sort of service. This has to be assessed almost immediately of whether it should be a helicopter, an inshore lifeboat or a lifeboat or any other craft that is out there that I know about that can assist me with this rescue operation. If I've assessed the situation requires a, a lifeboat, my first job is to get in touch with the Honorary Secretary. Having decided that the lifeboat should go, and the approval is given, the Coast Guard then makes the call for the lifeboat crew to come out. Communications between the lifeboat and this station would pass information concerning the distress. I would receive information of the lifeboat's crew, their state at that particular time, and their direction in which they're going. And we would keep in constant communication the whole time. In this particular station, we have the assistance of the Port of London Authority in the back, who have the radar that can give us assistance. That's all attention. OK, Doctor. Two first aiders up with a doctor.
sound like this, was he? Okay, let's have the broom handles. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Down through the top. The Sheerness lifeboat has been in existence now. 10 years, where some lifeboats have been in existence over 100 years. And consequently, the, co the community have practically built up round the lifeboat, especially in some of these small fishing villages. When you arrive at a commercial port, as Sheerness is, then you haven't got that community spirit towards the lifeboat and it doesn't really matter to us if the population of Sheppey didn't know we yeah. had a lifeboat. We're not there for that sort of thing. Uh, read down, got a shout, why not? We was, we was in a pub, as it happens. In a pub. Uh, phone, phone rang. I'd seen red flares down off of Whitstable. <laughs> And just after that, come down dense fog. So we come out of the way with old Gertrude, cleared the end of the island, and there, right on top of Lays Down Flats, right close in under the beach, was his echo. Jog, jogged in, jogged in, give a shout, not no, no reply, no reply. I thought, hello, they've gone over the side here. Cabin doors open. Moon just coming through the mist now. It was just beginning to clear a little bit. Old yacht swaying around all nice and calm. Come up alongside, lugged a big searchlight off the canopy, shone it down through the door. This fella and this girl sat upright, bolt upright, naked as the day they was born. Well, she had these little red socks on, see? Can you help me? I am lost, says this bloke. He says, you're looking as if you're doing all right to me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right. Yeah, but I normally jump aboard and help this one. Yeah, people, but you stop no, me. Well, <laughs> it turned out, it was a Belgian couple, you know. He said to me, I am bumping everything in the Thames estuary. He said, and I am stopping here. I said, did you fire a flare? He says, no. So I said, well, you must come with us then and we must continue now to look for the flare, you see. So we took him started to take him in tow and he's got hold of the tiller and he's steering away behind us there. So I says to one of the lads, I said, here, I says, tell him to lash the tiller. I says, and uh, get his head down, you know, I said, it would be a long night. They said, you know, you lash the tiller and you can go to sleep. Mm, this is good. Of course, the old hatch went down, doors went shut. Six o'clock, six o'clock in the morning we got back. Pulled him up alongside, not a sign of life. On the top of the old cabin. Yeah, he said. Well, we're here now. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> he used to send he used to send us a Christmas. That's all we do now is the emergency steering. This particular type of steering is rod steering. So for any reason at all, we're taking a hard bang on the sport side where the rods go down and they might have been buckled. We'll rig the emergency steering. Ricky will go on the throttles. I'll go back aft, and there will be a man stationed here to tell Ricky what I'm saying. Got it? Fine. Got it? Right, take over the throttles. Well done, mate. Two thousand revs. Two thousand revs. it is.
without any doubt. I think probably Charlie is one of the finest natural coxswains in this area. Um, his experience goes back many years before he joined us. And his ability to handle a boat is like the extension of his fingers. The sea is a funny thing, you never beat it, you know, you know, you go out there and have a go. But all the time you know that you're not the winner. And at any moment that the sea decides that he's had enough of this little boat out there, he'll just smack you back on your beam ends and then you know who's boss. 1,500 reds. 1,500 reds. 1,500 reds. He's too idle. He's too idle. People come along and they ask us to scatter ashes of relatives, of uh, local men. And we like to make it nice for the people. Maybe sometimes, occasionally, they bring a, a little wreath to place on the water afterwards. And we stop the engines and go through the service with the people, scatter the ashes, then we'll start the engines and just maybe cruise in a circle and give the family just sort of five minutes to themselves. I mean, I don't go to church because I don't think that you've got to go to church if you want to speak to God. I can speak to God sitting here. What do I want to go to church for? I mean, uh, I know who's out there helping me when I'm out there. And I truly believe that, you see. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't waste my breath. You might be having a quick few words in the wheelhouse while the lads are outside getting everything ready, just to sort of uh, make sure he's about. And uh, I think it helps you. I think it helps you, uh, helps you through the nasty bits. Yeah. Sheerness, Kent, December 1978. At 2046, on December the 30th, the Waveney class lifeboat Helen Turnbull was launched at 2106 and proceeded upriver in poor visibility. The wind was northeast, force nine, and there were breaking seas in the medway. It was learnt that the cruiser Marjoli II was overdue on passage from London. And we fired a couple of parachute flares which weren't as helpful as they would normally have been under the circumstances because of the very, very poor visibility. And the coxswain called to me to come into the wheelhouse and he said, there's a light over there, he said, and I'm sure it's blinking SOS. And the coxswain was concerned that the cruiser must be close to a known submerged wreck and many yacht moorings. Despite the known hazards, the lifeboat was taken into the shallow water and with skill, the coxswain turned the boat short rounds some 15 feet from the cruiser. Uh, we got alongside and we were shouting instructions to the two occupants and we were more than a little surprised to be advised that one of them was partially blind and they were both wearing uh, buoyancy aids, not life jackets, buoyancy aids, they're like waistcoats, and they lace up at the front, N none of which were laced up, you know, the easiest things to come out of in the world. And in quite heavy sea conditions, we came alongside, came alongside, and as we then began pounding together alongside this craft. When we say steel on wood, so got to have one result, the wood begins to come off worse and we grabbed hold of this first guy who was blind and literally dragged him bodily across the railings and onto the lifeboat. Then we had to clear the craft again and we got ourselves sorted out, soaked in again, came alongside him where we began to pound very heavily again and we were able to lean over the rails and drag him off. For his determination and expert seamanship in atrocious weather conditions and with little room for error, the second service class to the institution's bronze medal for gallantry has been awarded to coxswain mechanic Charles Bowery.
since the lifeboat's been at Sheerness, 10 years, we're just coming up to 200 lives saved now. And I think that because we're such a young station, that's not a bad little record. Every man sort of hopes that his son's going to follow in his footsteps. And you can never really be 100% sure of that until they actually leave school and they're standing on the boat there with you. Because they develop minds of their own, different ways they want to go. And you hope that uh, it's going to start an atmosphere. The boat bonds the family all together, I think, because. Um, when you use a boat like that, it's all part and parcel of you. You can feel the boat. A lot of people won't understand it, really, but you can feel the boat getting hurt, you know. And I think that this is all part of a family thing, you know. And my son's been baptised on the boat. It's bonded us all together. We're all part of a family, really. Now bring her round to me. Hold round, really turn it up now. Just got to lock the lifeboat station up, eh? And then we're, we're way out. 